and Good we're live, I hope. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the WAN Show. Welcome to the WAN Show, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you guys today. A lot of good topics. Microsoft has updated, clarified, whatever word you want to use to describe it. The Windows 11 recommended system yeah. requirements now allow you to install it on an older PC. So we're going to talk through all the details of that. In other news, Western Digital appears to have pulled an A-Data, swapping out components on their solid-state drives. Oh, by the way, Samsung also got busted doing the same thing earlier this week. So we're going to talk in more detail about that. What oh, else we gee. got here? Uh, OnlyFans reverses their decision on banning adult content. So dodged that didn't waste a bunch of development time there nice nice uh, also tsmc has raised their prices by up to 20 percent, and so has like global foundries psmc smic umc just everybody raising prices across the board electronics are about to get even more expensive ladies and gentlemen let's go ahead and roll that intro hopefully there'll be some good news as well nope only bad yeah <laughs> Actually, there is good news. And the show is brought to y'all today by our sponsors, PDF Element, Secret Lab, and Green Man Gaming. All right, let's jump right into our first topic of the day. Microsoft has updated the Windows 11 recommended system requirements. This comes to us courtesy of Microsoft's own blog. This is a little <clears throat> update on Windows 11 minimum system requirements and the PC Health Check app. If you guys didn't remember, the PC Health Check app was this super basic tool that pretty much just said, Hey, you're not eligible without really telling you exactly why, which led to a fair bit of confusion in the Windows community, which is basically the PC user community. Although actually, uh, I actually hosted a Facebook live audio room earlier that ended up being a fantastic discussion with the one and only Wendell from Level 1 nice. Techs, with the topic being Linux then, now, and the future. And he Ooh. and I both agreed for different reasons that desktop computing in the future could easily change over to Linux. Um, or at least I think I convinced him. I think I convinced him of my rationale behind it. And we can, I don't know, Luke, if you want to throw that in the dock, we can talk about that a little bit more later. Sure. But yeah. getting Wendell's contribution aside is probably really important. I, I think it's pinned on our Facebook page. It's a live audio room. Anyway, Microsoft made a blog post today outlining their results from a revisit to the Windows 11 system requirements. And there's some good takeaways here. And there's also some ones that are going to be really disappointing for a lot of people who bought computers not that long ago. What they concluded is that the original list of compatible 64-bit processors, um, blah, 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 is the right minimum system requirements to deliver on the principles they established for the best user support. So they're basically saying after further inspection, we were, we were correct. They did, however, identify that there was a group of PC models that met the principles while running on 7th gen rather than 8th gen or higher CPUs. So Intel's Core 7820HQ, okay, but this is only select devices that shipped with modern drivers based on declarative, componentized, hardware-supported apps design principles, including the Surface Studio 2, and Intel's Core X series and Xeon W series. So those are the only 7th gen CPUs that they found met the requirement. So to summarize, this means that if you have a 1st gen Ryzen CPU, which uh, last time I checked was really not that long ago. I mean, when did the Ryzen 1600X launch? 2017. That, that, that was only... Is that right? Yep. April 2017, just four years ago, 
Windows 11 is not for you. And if you have a seventh gen CPU that isn't one of the ones that we just listed, so basically most of them, you are plum out of luck. Specific Ryzen 2000 series CPUs are unsupported as well. So specifically, this would be ones like the 2200G and 2400G. If I recall correctly, those are not Zen 2 based. Those are like Zen Plus or something like that. Are they Zen 1 or what type of Zen are they? Blah, 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 based on the Zen architecture. So they were named 2000 series, but effectively they weren't. I'm really glad that AMD is cleaning up this problem with their processor naming scheme now. For a while, they had uh, mobile CPUs that sounded like they were a generation further along than they actually yeah. were. And it looks like as we move into 5000 and 6000 series, that should no longer be the case going forward. I really hope they can keep that tidy. There was really no excuse for how stupid that was. Now, their reasoning for not adding more CPUs or older ones to the list was due to reliability, security, and compatibility. Um, sorry, what? They didn't provide any sort of granularity to these results, though. Like, do their, their crash numbers apply to all seventh gen CPUs or like, so here, here basically this is an Imgur capture of, of what they mean by that. So reliability means devices that do not meet the minimum system requirements had 52% more kernel mode crashes. Uh, sort of raises a question, who is that on? Is that on, is that on Microsoft or is that on the, the device, the person who didn't upgrade their computer? Devices that do meet the minimum system requirements had a 99.8% crash free experience. Okay. Security. Windows 11 raises the baseline, blah, 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 etc., etc. Compatibility. People continue to increasingly use their PCs for video conferencing, productivity, and gaming. And they set the minimum system requirements to align with some of the most commonly used apps. Well, one issue I have with that is that basically just sounds like Microsoft wants to hand over every user who only needs to do basic word processing and email to Google. Okay, Microsoft says. Why don't you just buy a Chromebook then? To which people might reply, I guess I will. So that's interesting. Oh, I have man. been trying so hard to find this audio room. And I don't know if I'm just too young for Facebook now or what. But as far as I can tell, it's just gone. Oh. Um, if you message Jono, maybe he can either fix that or link you to where to find it. According to The Verge, Microsoft also clarified that they will only be enforcing their system requirements if you are upgrading from Windows 10 to Windows 11. This will not be enforced on clean installations of Windows 11. So the good news from all of this is that Microsoft is basically sticking to its guns saying, for the best Windows 11 experience, you really should have a newer computer. But if you install Windows 11 clean from just from a USB thumb drive, nothing will prevent you from installing it on an older machine. So apparently this functionality is designed primarily for businesses to evaluate Windows 11 and they will allow people to upgrade to it at their own risk in this fashion, but the company can't guarantee driver compatibility and overall system reliability. Microsoft will not be recommending or advertising this method of installing Windows 11 to consumers. So that was a lot of doom and gloom and bad sounding stuff at the beginning of this segment. But overall, I think this is um, about the best we could have expected. Now, this is probably my tinfoil hat kind of coming out here a little bit but i think the big the big takeaway here is not the method by which microsoft is allowing windows 11 to be installed on older hardware but rather the specific users that microsoft is locking out of windows 11 and that would be people that are taking advantage of loopholes in the Microsoft free upgrade from older operating systems system that allow them to sort of um, launder a pirated copy of Windows by just upgrading it through multiple versions of Windows. Um, with that yeah. said, so, so it sounds like they're trying to shed 
a lot of that dead weight that upgraded their, their cracked versions of Windows 7 to Windows 10, because that would be a group of users that is running older hardware. With that said, I can't see how anything would prevent you from taking that drive, either installing it in a newer system or cloning it over to a newer system, and then performing the upgrade. So yep. there will still be ways to work around it, but maybe it's just going to be a little more difficult. Overall, because Windows 11 is a bit of a nothing burger in terms of performance upgrades from what we saw, at least for gaming, uh, there's no real reason for you to be worried about this in any way because you can still install it clean if you really want to. And the probably the best way to pirate Windows is the is the official way, which is to just say, no, I don't have a license key when you're installing it, and then just run it forever and not be able to change your desktop background. Oh, except you can if you just right click on a picture and set as desktop background. That's that's probably the, the easiest way to, to pirate Windows these days. So nothing prevents you from continuing to do that. It's just that Microsoft isn't going to condone you running older hardware. So, all right. Sounds good, and I guess I don't have to worry too much about any of it. Um, also, because I, I actually, I finally activated the Windows install on my home desktop, Luke. I, I did too. I don't know if you know about that. Oh, did you really? Why I don't did you remember do that? why. I, I honestly don't remember. It was quite a while ago, though. I think um, I was watching a movie full screen, and I was just kind of tired of looking at the watermark. And I was just like, how much does this cost? You know what? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> just... I feel like I, I like needed to for some reason or something. Um... Oh, okay. I was on a call. I was on a work call, not with an employee. It was an external. I don't remember who it was, but it was like an external person. And I was screen sharing and they like mentioned it. And I was like, yep, that doesn't sound very pro. <laughs> so I fixed it. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, Jay Kiever is in Floatplane Chat, says DIY upgraders are such a small segment of the market, they don't care about us. They're drawing a line to maximize the amount of average users they can sell a new OEM license to. Honestly, I don't even think Microsoft is after selling new OEM licenses. No, I don't it's, think so. It's, it's, not, it's not that many. I mean, it's a lot, to be clear. Like, here, let's, let's, pull, up, let's pull up Windows 10 on Newegg, okay? Here we go. Here we go. All right? Windows 10, this one, this one right here, is the number one bestseller in operating systems. That makes sense. Whoa. 1,382 reviews. Now, that's a lot. You know, like if I were to use, if I were to extrapolate those numbers based on the, um, uh, based on the numbers that I see for like the ABCs of gaming on Amazon, like how many we sold versus how many reviews those are. I mean, that's 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 tens of thousands, maybe into hundreds of thousands of units, probably. Um, especially when you factor in that there's other avenues by which Microsoft can directly sell Windows to users, and there's other stores other than Newegg. B but in the grand scheme of things, okay, let's go look for a Ryzen 5600X. CPU. Okay, so let's go take one, probably the most popular. Yep, there it is. The most popular desktop CPU. Holy smokes. 1,766 reviews for this thing. Something here doesn't compute. There's only like, what? Maybe, so we got, which, which Windows 10? So we got 64-bit OEM. We got the retail one with the thumb drive, that's got another 300 reviews. Okay, there's Pro, so that's another 13. Oh, wow, no, these are combined. Home and Pro here, 1382. Uh, there, here's another boxed one. Here's a, like a retail one. Uh, this is combined with this one, though. Oh, that's hilarious, 376. Those are the same. This 285 here. Oh, whoops, you guys can't see what I'm looking at here. Whoops, sorry. These two both have 285, so those appear to be a combined one as well. Um, something doesn't compute. Clearly, a lot of people are buying the most popular CPU and then not buying Windows. Um, so even the OEM market, what I'm trying to say, is not as big of a deal as you might think. What, what Microsoft is trying to do is they're trying to drive 
overall sales of new computers forward because that's something that Microsoft stands to benefit from in the long term. They want people, when people buy a new computer, they want them buying a new Windows computer and they want that happening on a reasonably uh, frequent basis because it's good for their partners. What's good for the goose is good for the ganders. And Microsoft has taken that approach for a very, very, very long time. So, yeah, I, I, I'm glad they're leaving us the capability to do it. I mean, I, I, th I suspect they, they realized that there would have been, people would have found a hacky way around it anyway. Uh, so I'm glad they're just kind of accepting it. But I also understand why they want people to have a good experience on Windows 11, especially if a lot of their branding around Windows 11 is going to be, you know, this is the most reliable Windows ever. This is the most secure Windows ever. In other news, speaking of reliability, Western Digital has apparently pulled an A data which is not oh, a good yeah. thing. We did a video recently oh. outlining how A data has over the years played basically a component roulette with the components that might end up in your what was it? The SX 8100 or 8200? I can't remember exactly the model. The model. Sure. Yeah, the model of SSD. But we had our community submit. We actually paid them for them. We bought them for, I think it was like twice the market rate uh, to make it worth people's time to reformat their machine. But we, we bought these ADATA SSDs from our community and we compared them. We benchmarked them. Uh, we used a tool that allowed us to see exactly what components made them up. And we got five different drives that had almost nothing in common with each other. And when you consider that an SSD is just a controller, a DRAM cache, assuming you get a decent one, and NAND flash, if you change even one, let alone two, or all three of those components, you are completely changing it to a different product. So Western Digital has performed a nearly silent NAND swap on the WD Blue SN550, much like the recent incidents with A Data and Crucial. This new NAND on the SN550 has significantly slower write speeds once the cache becomes exhausted. According to Extreme Tech, the average write speed when the static 12 gig SLC cache is exhausted is as low as 394 megabytes per second on the new drive. Previous iterations of the drive would average around 610 after exhausting the cache. That is a huge difference. And the problem, actually, I, I see a couple of problems here. One of them is that this is on a drive that advertises write speeds of up to 2400 megabytes per second. And the other is that the average user would have no way of knowing that a change like this has been made until all of a sudden they go to do something demanding with their drive and it's just slow and they don't understand why. With a 12 gigabyte SLC cache, so if you guys aren't familiar, an SLC cache basically takes a component of your MLC or TLC or QLC NAND, so that's how many bits per cell are being stored, and it operates it in SLC or single bit per cell mode. What that does is it effectively cuts in half or a third, or even a quarter, how much data you can store on that cache component, but it makes it perform way better, especially for writes, and endurance as well, actually, for that matter. All right, so that SLC cache, super fast, but, and it's great for, you know, if you're installing Photoshop or something like that. That's gonna happen real fast, as fast as your CPU can keep up with decompressing the files and, and uh, feeding the SSD with data to write. The problem is that as soon as you go to do something heavy, 12 gigs is actually not that much in the context of, let's say, for example, installing a Vidya game. Like Luke, off the top of your head, okay? Can you think of any games that are larger than 12 yes. gigabytes? <laughs> Hit me with one. I can I can think of a game that's ten over ten times bigger than that. Um, Call of Duty. <laughs> Call of Duty is yeah. notoriously massive. Um, notoriously the last massive. few Call of Duty games have been like well over a hundred gigs each. Um, there's so, yeah. The way these SLC caches work is as long as everything you're doing fits within them, everything is hunky dory. Everything's fast. But once you are have the and then and then once the drive is idle. 
it'll flush that cash slowly over time, right? Out to the uh, less performant, you know, TLC or QLC operating mode NAND. All right, so if you were to go and install a massive game, for example, it is very conceivable that after a short period of time, your performance would absolutely tank. And now we're talking as low as about two thirds of the performance that you would have had before the NAND swap. In the real world, probably won't work out that way. It probably won't affect it to that degree because there are other bottlenecks when you're installing a program, unless you're just doing a raw file copy. But yeah. It's not a good look. So here is the statement they made to Tom's hardware, though. In June 2021, we replaced the NAND in the WD Blue SN550 NVMe SSD and updated the firmware. At the time, we updated the product data sheet. For greater transparency going forward, if we make a change to an existing internal SSD, we commit to introducing a new model number whenever any related published specifications are impacted. We value our customers and are committed to providing the best possible solutions for their data storage needs. The issue is that this isn't the first time that WD has ever had egg on their face for not for, for improperly labeling a drive. I mean, do you guys remember that whole shingled magnetic recording scandal? It's, I rings a bell. Didn't yeah. WD issue a previous statement? WD statement shingled drives. Let's see if I can find it. WD admits two to six terabyte WD red NAS drives use shingled magnetic recording, which is really bad for NAS operation. Let's see if we can find their statement. Blah, 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 blah. SMR issue, blah, blah. WD comment. Here we go. Um, Okay, blah, blah, blah. Workloads tend to be not found. Okay. Um. <laughs> Here we go. All right, I got it. You are correct that we do not specify the recording technology in our WD Red hard drive documentation. We strive to make the experience for our NAS customers seamless. And recording technology typically does not impact small business slash home NAS based use cases. Uh, so, okay. In fairness, they did not commit, at least in this statement, to more accurately label their products. So I guess that's um, something. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is this, at least they didn't break their promise since they didn't make didn't uh, make a promise. They didn't make a promise None. last time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the issue though is that if they truly value their customers, it shouldn't have taken backlash from news outlets to make a statement on this, and this should never have happened in the first place. I mean, barely anybody reads data sheets because marketing material yeah. is what you're you're supposed to be able to rely on it. <sighs> yeah. And I know, I know, people like us will say, don't you know, don't read in, don't buy the marketing, you know, don't read into the marketing. But but also when the marketing is just a specification. You're not supposed to have to go find the separate list of specifications. That's not fair. And like, I don't want to be that guy, but it's it's a fairly boring product. Yeah. That I think a lot of people want to be able to buy off of recommendation. Exactly. And recommendation could be out of date compared to your product sheet. Um, so it should really be a new model. You do um, not want to read 100 reviews of like a $100 yeah. SSD. You want to be able to trust that if you're buying from a company like Western Digital, that it's yes. just what it's supposed to be. It's exactly the grade of product that you expect it to be. Like people buy based on a brand. And of course, WD has fantastic products like their, uh, what is it, SN850 uh, Black SSD. Uh, it's really, really, really fast drive. And so a lot of the time, that's how Halo marketing works, right? You have the best product on the market. And so people just kind of go, oh, yeah, they make good stuff, uh, but I can't afford their, their best. But so I'll buy this, knowing that I can trust it. When you pull a move like this, you erode that trust. <sighs> oh, right. And in other news, Samsung actually pulled a similar move. So the legendary 970 Evo Plus fantastic drive for the money samsung actually went and um this is really complicated it looks like my notes here don't cover all the details about this but basically what samsung did was because of the silicon shortage uh, and because of the uh, covid restrictions the 
factory that makes the controller in the 970 Evo Plus has apparently been offline since about February. So due to shortages, they're actually apparently using the same controller from the 980 Pro. This is all out of memory for me because these are, this is not in my notes, but if I recall correctly, that is the case. Right. That sounds on paper like an upgrade, right? Except yeah. that one of the key functions of the controller in the 980 Pro is PCI Express Gen 4 compatibility. That's turned off. So what Samsung has done is they have increased the cache from 45 gigs to 112 gigs. They've changed the packaging and the write speed when you're not using that SLC cache. So theoretically, you might not notice this change because you've got a larger cache. But the write speed when you're not using the cache has gone from about 1500 megabytes per second to just 800. So what sounds on the surface like an upgrade does not actually appear to be an upgrade, which I would say is unfortunate, but this isn't fortune. This is intentional. They knew it. They knew they did it. They changed the packaging and they expected us to just keep keep buying the 970 Evo Plus thinking that it's still the same drive we loved. Samsung, come on, you're the vertically integrated one. You're the one that I'm supposed to be able to just recommend without worrying about it at all. You know who I don't think has ever been it's embroiled okay. in one of these controversies? I don't think Intel has. I've had my own issues with Intel SSDs, but... Crucial? Crucial. Has Crucial ever pulled uh, an SSD? You know what? I I think they have. That kind of that kind of rings a bell. I think Crucial has probably has probably changed NAND. Although I don't know if they've ever been caught with a clear downgrade. I'll have to count on the chat to let me know. Fire um, beware! Crucial swaps P2 SSDs TLC NAND for slower chips. R.I.P. R.I.P. Crucial. Yeah. I tried. I, mean, I just kind of thought, like, I haven't heard any news about Crucial in a long time, so so maybe they're okay, but apparently not. Black Darkstorm asks, what about Sabrent? I don't think Sabrent has managed to attract any controversy yet, but Sabrent, unlike a lot of these other companies, WD, Crucial, um, Intel, not to a lesser extent now, but at least before, uh, Samsung for sure, these guys are all to some extent vertically integrated, which is to say that they manufacture the components oh, wow. that make up the finished product. Um, this this news is from this month. Oh, Crucial? Yeah, this was August 16th. Oh, well, that's awkward. Yeah. Uh, okay, Gremlin Injector says SK Hynix, but nobody cares about them and most of their customers are system integrators. So for all we know, they have swapped things, but that would have been something they would have coordinated with the system integrator because no one cares about the spec of an SK Hynix drive. They care about the spec of the computer. So as long as that's maintained, then I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, with that said, SK Hynix has some really solid drives these days. Like if I recall correctly, they have, it's not one of the most performant drives, but their P31, this is off the top of my head, sorry, their P31 is super power efficient. So in terms of performance per watt, if I recall correctly, that's a really outstanding drive. Uh, they don't get enough credit because they've been around a long time making OEM drives, as you alluded to, but they, uh, they just don't have the recognition in the consumer space. Uh, Max, Max the Everything 7 on Floatplane says, I mean, Samsung had literally been pushing their 980 DRAMless SSDs on Amazon as equal to their Evo and Pro lines. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fair. Ascopti says, Kyoxia. I don't think Kyoxia has been nailed. Um, I don't think so. Or even it's Toshiba, pre Kyoxia. I mean, one of the companies they acquired definitely ran afoul of uh, these kinds of uh, <laughs> these kinds of guidelines we're providing. You know, don't change products without telling the consumer. The Kyoxia or Toshiba acquired OCZ way back in the day, and they they definitely <clears throat> they definitely had issues. Yeah, with that, that. Was, yeah, just a few. Um, SK Hynix is is their is their public popularity more of a North American thing? Like the their lack of it, you mean? Yeah, that could be. Um, I know that they've because, been like 
when when if you remember when I was trying to get my like my RAM and drives for my my previous Geodude system. Yeah. The problem was that they didn't have availability in North America. Not that they didn't have availability. Mm, got it. So um, I, I don't know, but I, I think they're. I'm not sure. Might be more popular elsewhere. Might just completely not be. I don't know. <laughs> Newegg has almost no reviews for pretty much anything SK Hynix. But the Gold P31, that SSD I alluded to before, um, has almost 1,000 ratings on Amazon, on Amazon. So it seems like that's something that they are addressing, at least to a degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Their 500 gig version on Newegg.com has uh, over 4,000 reviews. Um, five stars. So it lo it's funny because these fortunes always uh, come and go, right? Like SK Hynix for many years, like way back in the day, I'm talking like 15, 15 years ago, right? Like SK Hynix had a reputation for being like the crappy RAM on your GPU. That was kind of the only yeah. context that yeah. you'd have for SK <laughs> Hynix is like, Oh, you better hope you get you get Samsung chips because if you get the SK Hynix version, your RAM won't overclock as well, like stuff like that. Uh, but nowadays, they're actually building a reputation around you know power efficiency and solid performance, even if it's not you know industry leading performance. Like I don't even think they have a Gen Four drive yet. They're they're going slow, slow and steady wins the race, I guess. Yeah. Not that slow and steady will win the race to our sponsors. Hey. Hey. Uh, check this out. We're sponsored by Green Man Gaming, ladies and gentlemen. Green Man Pretty Gaming cool. offers a wide range of games from AAA to indie titles across multiple platforms in 196 countries worldwide. They've got games like Eldest Ring, Sleeping Dogs, and even Supreme Commander 2 on sale for up to 87% off. Uh, Supreme Commander 2, can't say I really recommend that particular one because you should just get Supreme Commander Forged Alliance, which is the first one, and then you should go join Forged Alliance Forever, super cool community that's keeping that game going. Anyway, the point is, Green Man Gaming receives game keys directly from the publisher and will refund or replace your key if you run into any problems. So don't wait. Go check out Green Man Gaming at the link in the video description. It's a great place to get discount games or really just any games. The show is also brought to you by uh, PDF Element. PDF Element allows you to edit, annotate, sign, and present all your school documents or whatever other PDFs on Windows, Mac, and iOS. You can convert any PDF to and from Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint without losing any of your formatting. And you can even search for words or text through large PDF files. You can add certified digital signatures to help recipients validate document authenticity and integrity. And PDF Element is currently offering a back to school sale. So get up to 50% off PDF Element at the link down below. Finally, the show is brought to you by Secret Lab. Secret Lab chairs are engineered to keep you incredibly comfortable for long hours at work and play. Um, I, hmm, this is a little awkward. So for those of you who are wondering, if you want the inside scoop on Secret Lab, uh, Secret Lab was who Alex chose for his gaming chair, or really, well, everything chair, uh, for his Intel Extreme Tech upgrade. And I haven't personally used a Secret Labs chair, but I can say that I have a lot of experience with the product and it's really good. They make great chairs and they are, they are my favorite chairs. There's a lot of gaming chairs out there that suck. Um, I, I mean, man, back, back when we were reviewing gaming chairs, I was amazed at how same they could look, yet how different they could be. Like Arazi comes to mind as one that looks fine, but is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, right. Oh, I sh probably shouldn't be bad mouthing other brands in a sponsor spot for another brand. Do those guys even exist anymore, though? They probably don't. Oh, wow, they do. Well, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they're better now. The point is, I know for sure Secret Labs products really good. Um, did I did I just close my my dock that had all my notes in it? That's uh, this is really awkward. This is going great. This is the best sponsor read I've ever done. They're <laughs> definitely going to work with us again. 
So I think this is the first time we've worked with them too. Okay, the point is, their new Titan Evo 2022 chair keeps you feeling comfortable for longer hours with their four-way lumbar support and their ultra comfortable line of different seat material. I don't even know what that means exactly. Their chairs come with up to a five year extended warranty. They have a 49 day return policy and you can head to the link in the description to check out Secret Lab today. All right, we made it through it. I think I think they're missing an S. I think it's ultra comfortable line of different seat materials. Got it. Cool. All right, what else we got today? Oh, actually, one more thing, since I'm kind of on a roll did, here Did right you do now. PDF Element? I did. Okay. Uh, since I'm kind of on a roll, we just launched a new product over on LTT Store. Hey! Hey, the Linus Selfie Mouse Pad and the Sad Linus Desk Pad. Uh, these, are, these are kind of meme products, so they're actually coming in at a lower price than the Northern Lights Desk Pad. This is our premium product. This is our, you guys asked for it, so here it is, product. Uh, they only come in one size each, but they're there. They're for a limited time. Go check them out. This is what Sad Linus will look like looking at you over top of your keyboard and mouse. There he is next to a computer. There's his empty, soulless eyes. Thank you very much, Hoffman, for the fantastic photography you've done. And then the original. The original selfie meme face thing. I mean, it's the same high quality construction. Just, we're, we're memeing it up, guys. Enjoy, enjoy, limited time only. At the only. same time, if you, if you want uh, the original mouse pad, the Northern Lights desk pad, there are uh, a, a ton of sizes, a ton of new sizes. Really small ones, really big ones. There's one that's 1,500 by 900. It's basically a, 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 desk a yoga size. mat almost. Yeah. Um, dangerously close. It's actually but, yeah. pretty close to the limit for weight that we can ship internationally without incurring like enormous shipping fees. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's like really big and really heavy. All right, let's yeah. move on to another topic. What else we got, Luke? Hit me. Uh, there's some interesting ones in the, in the rapid fire section. We could talk about OnlyFans. Um, <laughs> yeah. OnlyFans reverses their decision to ban adult content. So if you watch the last WAN show, we talked about it extensively. OnlyFans was like no more, Born is allowed on OnlyFans. Some lewd content is going to be allowed. We'll tell you more about it later. And yeah. then just like kind of dropped the whole conversation and has now come back and said, uh, psych, never mind. Everything's fine. Um, the this, this change is coming, yeah, less than a week after their initial announcement that they were planning to end adult hosted content. Not all of it, but yeah. Um, they've now secured assurances necessary to support our diverse creator community and have suspended the planned October 1 policy change um they're now preaching inclusion and saying they will provide a home for all creators i'm sure this comes off the back of probably a lot of creators jumping ship uh um, yeah a little bit the, it's, cons considering the porn industry is worth billions of dollars estimates say six to 97 billion what that's a big range that's a massive range uh there is clearly someone out there willing to pocket transaction fees yeah of course of course um, there is. i mean this is something that we know from research that we've done on this topic like i mean luke you've looked into alternate payment processing platform platforms before yeah. i'm going to say alternate i mean ones that are willing to uh process your payments sort of regardless of what time of type of content you have on your site i uh, can you can you talk a little bit about what that looks like they're really expensive um, and they, they always have been really expensive because they, they kind of know it's, it, they're in a weird spot because they, they, they seem to understand that if you are talking to them, you have to be talking to them. Um, right. And it's, it's, I don't know how many market segments are like that where like you're the not as good product, but you know that because you're the not as good product, if someone is talking to you, they don't have the option of using the better products. So you can actually charge them more. Um, Right. I, I what makes the payment processor common. not as good, though? Like, help me out here. Um, user experience can be pretty bad. Uh, the support on the back end, um, the the developer friendliness of it, um, compliance with different browser things. There's there's a lot that can be very annoying. Um, so you gloss over that stuff, yeah. but that's really interesting stuff that I think the average person would not know about. So just yeah, so you guys... well, and the average person basically never has to run into it because pretty much the whole internet doesn't run on those types of payment processors. 
uh, most payment processors that people use are, are from a very small grouping of payment processors that are very clean. Uh, you, you generally only deal with like, like Amazon payments, Google payments, Apple payments, uh, Shopify is actually really massive. Um, um, Stripe and, and PayPal or PayPal trading as Braintree. Um, and there isn't like a ton outside of that. There's some Exola stuff. If you did uh, Twitch back in the day and there was problems with that, and that's part of the reason why that's being phased out as far as I can tell uh, and some other things. But like, it's it's really annoying for everyone involved if the payment process is not basically perfect. Right. So if it's not pretty much perfect, people don't want to use it and they're going to file down into these uh these major payment processors we've got people in the float plane chat that are talking about crappy payment processors uh and just the bad experiences they've had with them so mills jonas yep. says i've had experiences with payment processors just not registering that i canceled a subscription and mm -hmm. then i had to fight for a refund um let's see here uh yep uh pen pen beach says implementation bugs poorly documented api uh, Happy Roll Cake says uh, Epoch apparently wouldn't remove their card details from their server. <laughs> apparently, Shopify Payments is built on Stripe, so that's even more of like, yeah, like why why deal with with difficult things? A lot of a lot of uh, consolidation has happened in the payment space over the years. Right, that makes sense. Um, and to be clear, I personally do not believe that this move was ever anything to do with OnlyFans not having any way to process payments. I mean, the porn industry no. has been around as long as the internet has existed. I mean, I, I wonder then. if there's, I wonder if there's actually like, like an, like a historical sort of a record of this, like first nude picture on the internet. Is that was probably really early. I'm suspecting. There's got to be. There's got to be. What is this? What is this useless page here? What, what, what am I looking at? Okay. Brief history of... Well, while you look for that, I just... Uh, something we're actually quite happy about is that we decided not to pursue creating an alternative uh, because psych, probably most people that are on there are going to stay. I do think a very significant amount of people have probably left and just uh, as someone who kind of used to be, I guess, a creator uh, to other potential creators, I would highly recommend diversifying your platforms. Um, hopefully this was enough of a like kick in the butt to get you to do that. Uh, yeah. But even if you're still on that platform and you're like, oh, poof, my like livelihood isn't being ripped out from under me. That's great. And I'm, I'm happy for you about that. But you should also definitely diversify your platforms. Um, I don't have an offering for you. So this is not even self pandering, but you should still do it. Try to find somewhere else that you can set up shop as well. Um, even if you're just mirroring your uploads on both platforms, whatever, having a, a base somewhere is very valuable. Yep. Um, so, I mean, really it appears that it had everything to do with raising funds and taking on investors. Um, the thing is that OnlyFans appeared to have overplayed their hand a little bit. It seems like uh, more than Luke and I anticipated, there must be safe for work content on OnlyFans. It's just that maybe what they felt was that the safe for work content had this momentum that would carry them through this transition. But maybe what they didn't realize was that the only reason safe for work content creators were surviving on the platform was that so many users were being driven to it by not safe for work content. Because once you're in the habit of using a platform, it's, I mean, how, how do I put this? There's only so many hours a day that you could comfortably, you know, <laughs> enjoy pornography. I, I think, I think. I think, okay, look, don't, don't, don't quote me on this. I actually really would prefer not to be quoted on this. Um, but then, you know, at some point you'll be done, so to speak. Oh, someone and watching was just like challenge accepted. <laughs> at some point you'll be done and you'll like want to do something else. And if only fans played their cards right, they could easily entice you to go do something safe for work at the same time. So it seems like they they misinterpreted that momentum in safe for work content 
as sort of a change in their identity as a platform, but what it actually was is just uh, a break, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think if they're smart, they will just keep making their ludicrous amounts of money, $600 million a year or whatever, not bother taking on investors, buy mega yachts for all of their founders because that's the kind of freaking money that they're making right now and just chillax with the whole investor thing or create a sister site, you know? I mean, yeah. that was that was the way that we were planning to address adult content. So there's no reason they couldn't do the same do thing. In reverse. Yeah. And you can use your, your adult content platform to get that sister site off the ground. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Instead of driving people to like a creator on OnlyFans that's safe for work, you could drive a creator to this sister site. I mean, since OnlyFans, uh, most of the interactions, remember we started one recently, most of the interactions are done through the website, like just the mobile browser rather than an app because of just prudish app store policies. Um, so there, nothing would prevent you from just having that link open in a on a completely different site. You could probably even maintain logging credentials, Luke. Is that something you could do from a user privacy, user security? Uh, terms I think of use? there are some issues there. There's yeah. probably some. There's probably some. I'm not 100 percent certain, but I'm I'm pretty sure there's some issues there because it's a different. You have different agreements on both sites. Oh, that's that's yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, in other like in really bad news, how about we just put it that way? TSMC yeah. will be raising their prices by up to 20%. This comes courtesy of Tom's Hardware and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, yes, my friends, that is how mainstream this bad news is getting. World's largest chip maker to raise prices threatening costly electronics. This is not a threat. This is reality. This is just yeah. happening. So 7 nanometer and smaller wafers will increase as much as 10%, while 16 nanometer and uh, larger nodes will increase by 20% for all orders set to be fulfilled starting in December. TSMC's, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. I just said real, like it's, it's coming up basically now. Yep. Uh, by the time, if you were hoping that, you know, the, the shortage would go away and prices would fall, it looks like by the time that would have any hope of happening whatsoever, the raw prices of the materials will be going up. Although um, maybe that'll help with the shortage if fewer people can afford to buy anything. <sighs> That's not the solution we want. I also don't think it will because everything's just getting scalped every anyways, right? TSMC's N5 and N7 fabrication was 49% of their 13.29 billion in revenue in the second quarter of 2021, while N16 and N28 accounted for 25% of Q2 revenue. So companies like AMD and Qualcomm could see increased prices in the near future, as well as ASIC manufacturers like Bitmain. TSMC isn't the only one, though. Global Foundries, PSMC, SMIC, and UMC have all increased production prices recently. And you can bet that Intel, with the investments that they're making in new fabs right now, is going to be following suit, even as they get into the fabrication business and try to increase competition in that space. And the worst yeah. part of this, guys, is these numbers we're quoting you, 10%, 20%, you will be lucky if that's all you see in terms of end sticker price increase, because that ain't the way it works. Typically, just rough ballpark numbers. Typically, for every 1% that you increase the basic bill of materials cost of a product, you can expect to see about a 2% increase in the final end product. Once all the all the middlemen and stakeholders and packaging and marketing and blah, 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 blah. That's kind of a, your basic guideline for how much you can expect an increase in materials cost to affect the finished product. So that's yeah. rough because a 10% increase in the cost of the chip that goes at the heart of your GPU means that you could probably end up spending, I would say, on like a high-end GPU easily another $5,200. Don't underestimate how much this is going to suck. <sighs> I think it could be more than that. You said high-end GPU. I think it'd be more than that for sure. Well, remember too, though, that a lot of the cost of a high-end GPU is in memory as well. Uh, a lot of the cost is in power delivery. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, good I'm, point. I'm talking just 
the chip. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of crazy that it's across the board. This also, like, we we saw the GPU shortage kind of uh, barely, but we saw it kind of showing signs of going away. But uh, this, I have a feeling, is not going to be reversed. This, this ain't so good. this is probably here to stay. Yeah, and the the thing is that prices are whatever the market will bear. And NVIDIA had for a long time been playing a game of let's just quietly increase prices each generation. One of the most egregious ones was when the uh, GTX 680 came out. If you guys recall, the GTX 680 it was actually priced very competitively compared to its predecessor, the GTX 580, or was it 580 GTX? I can't remember when they moved the things around, but it doesn't matter. The 680 uh, sounded like a deal compared to the 580, except for one small detail. That's that the 680 used their... What, what 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 was 680 maxwell fermi then kepler I, I don't remember the point is it used their next tier down it, it didn't even use their largest chip whereas previously eight class gpus had always used their largest chip so they were effectively selling you like uh, a, a, a high-end rather than enthusiast-end GPU for the same price that the previous generation enthusiast one went for. It wasn't until we got the, I want to say, 780, because the higher-end 6 was 690, and that was a dual GPU chip. It wasn't until we got the 780 that that uh, large chip finally made its way into a consumer product, and by then they had managed to increase the price compared to the 580. So NVIDIA has been playing this game for a long time, but this pandemic situation, this shortage situation, has given them an excuse to just, you know, skip a bunch of steps. And when things settle down, they will settle. But I would be very surprised if we ever see another top tier GPU for, you know, 699, 749. I, yeah. I, think, I think those days are over. Yep, agreed. Do you want to talk about the Linux desktop future thing? Um, I want to talk about the Apple settling their developer class action lawsuit thing because this has huge implications and I'd like to kick it off. Uh, you, you can run through the topic because this is something you're a little bit better versed in than me. But I want to kick it off by saying to everyone who uh, defended Apple's behavior and said that Apple is not a monopoly and the App Store is just uh, their, their playground, their rules, um, this is Apple's admission this essentially yeah. that you're wrong their behavior was bad and you are actually wrong and you need to go read go read go read about antitrust go read about anti-monopoly laws go read please because i'm really i have gotten so many frustrating stupid tweets about this every time i talk about it i just get these horrendously bad takes apple's behavior is bad it's really bad. And the fact that they're settling this, the fact that they're settling this to the tune of $100 million in a small developer fund tells you how bad it is and how badly they want this to go away and not and continue this to be is a not, problem. This is not the epic lawsuit. No, this isn't even the watching. epic lawsuit yet. Okay, so Luke, yeah. why don't you run us through this? Okay, so th this one's a little weird, and I haven't like fully dove into it because it's not the epic one. Um, but in a settlement pending court approval, Apple agrees to um, a bunch of different terms. Clarify that developers can communicate directly with customers about alternative payment options outside of the app. This is very good. Very happy about that. Yep. That's like the core thing for us. That's the main thing we're excited about. Um, they they can, however, use contact information gleaned from the app now with permission. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, they are also establishing, this is the part that's like a little odd for me and I haven't dove far enough into. They're establishing a $100 million small developer fund uh, ranging between 250 bucks to $30,000 to developers based on their size. Yep. That I'm not 100% certain like how that's supposed to work. Also, it's like not really $100 million. It's closer to 70, but we'll get more into that in a moment. Um, also, they are going to keep the small business program for another three years, expand price points, clarify that developers can appeal rejections, commit to develop search and discovery to drive high quality apps. That one's a little interesting. I'm not 100% certain how that actually ties into the rest of it, but whatever. Um, and issue a transparency report about apps that are rejected and customer and developer accounts that are also rejected. That part is nice as well. 
I like that one too. Because yeah. sometimes it's really hard to tell why the heck your thing actually got rejected. And if you guys remember, we got stuck in a many month long rejection loop that they eventually just admitted like, oh yeah, we just actually like never really reviewed it. Um, yep. And it has been fine for a long time. And all these revisions of the app that you guys made trying to be more and more compliant was actually useless because you guys were fine from many months ago. That was incredibly frustrating. Yep. Um, something kind of funny, kind of awkward, kind of annoying. I don't know enough about the legal space to actually understand how off base or on base this is, to be completely honest. Um, like this might be totally normal. It doesn't sound normal to me, but that $100 million small developer assistance fund, uh, the lawyers that won this suit. So we're, we're happy about or reached a settlement that, with Apple. Right. Yes. Um, we're happy that this is happening. They're happy. That we're happy that they got there, but the lawyers are planning on taking, or I don't think it's planning. I believe they just are taking $30 million of the $100 million small developer assistance fund. Um, I know there's a lot of like different weird ways that lawyers are compensated for their yeah. work. So I don't know how like normal this is. I don't um, know how that's normal not that unusual. this would be. Yeah. Yeah. That's not yeah. that unusual for a lawyer to work for a very low rate with the um, goal of being, of winning the case with as large a settlement as possible and then getting paid out of that settlement. And in fact, it's one of the biggest problems with class action suits in general is that the only real beneficiary is lawyers. So the there's lawyers. this constant incentive for lawyers to just file more and more and more of these suits because uh, they basically get to go after a nice, a nice juicy vein uh, to suck onto that company gets to pay a whack of money because probably they did something wrong or maybe not. I don't know, whatever they managed to, the lawyers managed to win the lawsuit. And then the actual end users who were affected by this in some, in some meaningful way in a lot of cases. Um, I mean, I've seen settlements as small as like $5, right? Like it's not, it's not an amount of money that is almost not even worth filing for. Yeah. Yeah. That is meaningful in any way. So, the lawyer, so, you know, let's say you had a, a million dollar settlement, 30% of it goes to the lawyer or the law firm. So that's like 300 grand. And then, you know, $2 each to the, you know, what, what would that, or like $5 each to the, what would that work out to? Like 100,000 people, 120,000 people affected. It's like, okay. Uh, so basically the only purpose it served was getting the company to admit that they were wrong and then lawyers get money. Um, yeah, it's a big problem. Like, I don't know how to fix it. People in Floatplane chat are saying that it's extremely normal for attorneys to take like 30, 40%. I saw someone else say it's normally 20%. Who knows? Either way, I think this is as outrageous as it sounds. I think it's not technically out to lunch, which is which is kind of nuts. Um, and while some people are, are trying to style on the lawyers for, for doing this and the fact that they have four pages of reasons why they should get the $30 million, which just sounds funny. Um, I'm just happy that we're moving forward. I'm not super concerned about the small developer fund. There is a huge amount of developers. I suspect we would probably be considered under that and we would probably get next to nothing and it's not gonna matter. Um, what does matter is we're moving towards uh, better payment solutions for the App Store and we're moving towards Apple kind of admitting fault and i feel like them losing this one might help the like epic case which is more the one that we're actually hoping to to go through so yeah we'll That's have to take see a long time though because epic it asking, will uh, epic is asking for a lot more than these yes. developers were uh there are some really funny stories in float plane chat uh alana kation I think I got six dollars out of a class action suit against Google. Computer Whisperer says I got a dollar ninety-five from a PayPal lawsuit. Uh, <laughs> this is great. CMD underscore says I still have the never cashed check for a dollar twenty-five or something from a class action about a company using robo dialers. <laughs> this is great. Oh man. Oh yeah. And so West. Uh, T twenty seven says admits they were wrong. Okay, yeah, most of the settlements usually say something to the effect of claims no fault. That's a lot of the time. Um, part of the the payout is, you know, we're 
Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, they're going to say, no, we didn't do anything wrong because if they do, then it could open themselves up to more lawsuits. And, you know, because obviously if they did something wrong once, they probably did it wrong twice. Um, so, yeah, yep, you're probably right. But I still think that this will add fuel. The fact that Apple settled, whatever they legally said or not, does say something about uh, how how vulnerable they think that they are right now. And the fact that they settled for so much would seem to indicate that they're trying to buy a lot of goodwill right now. Um, yeah, they have not gotten a lot of good press for the way that they've treated app developers. Speaking of yeah, bad I, press. I would I oh. would have liked more stuff in there that helps the app developers in real ways instead of this like small developer fund thing, which is not actually going to really help very many small app developers in the long run um, and was just like looted for $30 million from the lawyers. I, I wish there was more actual stuff coming through, but at least there's some stuff coming through and hopefully it sets precedent, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, in other in other news, uh, what did I want to talk about here? Ah, yes, Samsung is bricking the Z Fold and Z Flip 3's cameras if you unlock the bootloader. Oh, that sucks. Um, Pretty so annoying. If, if you're a tinker, like, they already make it really difficult to get root file system also, access. It's also very intentional. Like, it's not It's not like, oh, we overlooked this thing and it happens to brick it when you unlock the thing. It's It's definitely on purpose. And it's just like, I understand, blah, blah, Samsung knocks, blah, blah, security. But the fact is that this is a feature that turns perfectly working hardware into a brick once you stop supporting it with your software updates, which you're Samsung. You're going to do that at some point. Um, so XDA senior members, oh boy, uh, White Bear is, I think, the direct translation from the Chinese name, and uh, Ian MacD. Um, showed the final confirmation screen during the bootloader unlock process on the Z Fold 3 that mentions that completing the operation will cause the camera to be disabled. So this isn't without precedent. Sony pulled this with their Xperia devices. Um, if you unlocked the bootloader of uh, any Sony Xperia device, it would result in nothing but green pictures. Other software features like Sony's video and audio enhancements were similarly borked. I would have to assume that this is to prevent anyone from reverse engineering the way that their enhancements work. That would be the only good reason I could think of for Sony to implement it in that particular way. But the big problem here is that if Samsung becomes as locked down as Apple, a lot of the benefits of going Android well, with a Samsung device go away compared to just buying an iPhone in the first place. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not that into that. What no, I am uh, into apparently though- there, Apparently there have been some workarounds already found, so. That's good to know. That's good. What I am into yeah. though is reading some super chats. Woo woo. Hey. Now I didn't get all of them because I specifically intentionally didn't click the viewer activity tab at the beginning of the WAN show. My apologies to anyone who sent one. You were sacrificed for the greater good because Google asked me to screen record the problem that I've been having and I did manage to record it. So I have a screen recording of Super Chats coming in, in the chat on the right, and then the viewer activity tab being empty and then I click the viewer activity tab and they start populating, which is really stupid and not supposed to happen. So hopefully they'll be able to fix it. Um, so you're, like I said, your sacrifice was for the greater good. Lilith Gaming says, I want to build my first ever PC. Um, what should I go for for a good experience? Well, you should watch one of our build guides and then you should post on the Linus Tech Tips forum in the new PC, uh, new, new build section. People will help you find the, the right components for your budget and for what you're trying to do. Like the best part of the forum. Um, Johnny, oh, let's, let's, let's look. I don't know how to pronounce that. Can we use lightly overclocked AMD FX 9590s as a loophole for California's electricity bill? It's pretty much a good idea to build a PC with that processor when you think about it. I have no idea what you're trying to get at. Um, the new... As far as my understanding goes, those laws only apply to systems sold, not 
new custom build. new systems sold, um, which you will not be putting an AMD FX 9590 in. And number two, um, an overclocked FX 9590, um, that is one of the most inefficient modern era processors. You just, like, I don't get it. You shouldn't buy one, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, I, no, I would not rec recommend that. I would not recommend that. Uh, TechCav says, I just watched your video on a customizable laptop. Very good showing what you could do with it. Did you or did you not invest in their company? I did. I have a video coming soon. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about why I made that decision. Uh, Matt Shatuk says, I've built several e-commerce sites and developer friendliness is definitely a significant factor for choosing a payment processor. Um, both Stripe and Square have been awesome. I can't say I share your experience with Stripe, but... Um, has that changed, Luke? Are they better now? No, Stripe's been good. Okay. Stripe's been pretty good the whole time. I thought they were it's a pain in the butt at the beginning. Braintree and PayPal. Oh, all right. Oh, PayPal. Good old PayPal. Yeah, Alex and they've been, Simba. They've been terrible the whole time. Says, Linus, do you have any plans to do another verified actual gamer drop? I'm sure there are several of us still waiting for a decent price. Yes! We actually have 100. If I recall correctly, they are 3080 TIs coming. From I think it's MSI. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, pretty sure. Oh, do you know that? Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not dead, ladies and gentlemen. It's coming back. Ah. This one's been planned and ready for so long. <laughs> it's um, actually been forever. Yeah, I know. Uh, Northern Rebel Twenty Seven says we're in a bad spot right now with the chip shortage. But is it reasonable to assume that the reactive investments that have been made will reshape the chipmaker landscape and make the future brighter as a whole? It's possible, um, but the thing is that I don't think these investments are being made with the intention of driving prices down. They're being made with um, with a keen eye toward how much demand there will be once these fabs go online. Uh, I don't think the intention is to overproduce and drive down prices. Sorry. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Uh, Mike Levin says, thanks, Linus. Finally catching a live show from New Zealand. Wanted to say thanks for the videos. Hey, thank you, Michael. And uh, John says, did you know the woman who invented one of the foundational technologies for Wi-Fi also starred in one of the most famous erotic films of all time? Um, no, I can't say I did. Thanks, Aram uh, Paladian. And Zero Two says, hey, guys, I need some more ports on my router. It only has four. What do you recommend to add more? That is such a simple tech tip. How have we never done a video on that? How to add more ports to your router. Uh, buy yourself a network Are switch. Are you sure you haven't? I'm sure. I'm sure. I have I never like done. I feel like on Tech Quickie or, or, or Lance Tech Tips. Nope. I have never done that. Like, I just, I, I just glossed right over that. Wow. Yeah. How have I never done that? To be fair, these videos, oh no, Tech with Brett from eight months ago. That is totally the kind of thing that people would search for and that I have never addressed. So what you need to do is you need to buy a network switch. So one of these is going to do you just nicely. If you only need a few more ports, this Netgear 5 port unmanaged switch will do just fine for $17. You plug one of your ports um, on your existing router into one of the ports on this little switch here and then you plug all your other devices into the rest of them they will share that uplink bandwidth so all those devices will now share the uh, one gigabit probably um, that the the one port on your upstream device is connected to it with but probably that is fine because they probably all won't be going full bore at the same time and what's nice is that if you have devices that are all connected to the little five port switch, um, they can communicate with each other at full gigabit speed. It's only if they have to cross over to devices on the other switch. So as long as you lay things out in a way that's kind of sensible, you can minimize the amount of traffic on that uh, potential bottleneck link, potentially bottleneck link. And that's it. It's the end of the WAN show. We will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Bye.